So we're in Matthew chapter 27, beginning around verse 45. Um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting section. Uh, I mean, this is the this is the death of Christ on the cross that we're at. And <clears throat> what's really interesting here is that it is a commentary by God on why the cross is important and what is the purpose of the cross. Uh, what's interesting is that God gives that information as he's actually on the cross and dying on the cross. And he gives it through a series of miracles uh, that occur while Jesus is on the cross. That's one thing that we're going to be looking at today. The other thing is, <coughs> the other thing is I'm getting over bronchitis, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully that will go away. Um, the other thing is that uh, <clears throat> we have here the, you know, some of the last words of Christ, uh, as some of you know who have been around a while, that, you know, Christ had seven messages that he gave uh, on the cross. And I actually want to look at all of those. So we want to look in, in some of the other Gospels to get that information as we go through here. So, so we're going to be looking at the kind of the six miracles that God uh, gives here in Matthew and the seven statements of Christ, all of them really to give you an understanding of what the cross is about. What's the purpose of it? What is it to accomplish? And so we're going to cover that. <clears throat> but let's start at verse 45. <clears throat> verse 45, chapter 27 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. So the sixth hour is what time? Yeah. Noon. Sixth hour is noon. Ninth hour is three. Three. In my notes, I have three a.m. Three p.m. Uh, from, from noon to three p.m. So you know the 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 heat of the day, the brightest part of the day. Uh, we have this darkness that comes over the land. Now, when was Jesus actually put on the cross? Anybody know? After the trial. <laughs> wow, good. All right, when was the trial? Wise guy. In the morning? It was in the morning, right? Six, seven a.m. ish, right? We had the the uh, kind of the second trial when he was brought back before the whole Sanhedrin. Um, in Mark, <clears throat> in Mark chapter 15, 25, we don't need to turn there. It actually says that he was crucified at 9 a.m. on the third hour. All right, so he's put on the cross at 9 a.m. We are now at uh, noon. <coughs> Excuse me. I haven't had any trouble for the last uh, 24 hours. Now, this morning, this thing's going to kick up. Um, so now at noon, uh, we pick up this darkness. So what has happened between 9 a.m. and noon? <clears throat> And that's when they've that's when they've uh yeah tortured him yeah persecuted him persecuted him spit at him and all uh, that occurred before they put him on the cross right i mean they put him on the cross at 9 a.m between 7 a.m and 9 a.m they did all the kicking and spitting and him dragging the cross up the hill and all that stuff occurs uh between 7 a.m and 9 a.m now from 9 a.m till 12 he's on the cross <clears throat> Yeah, but shouldn't they like throw dice for his clothes and that kind of stuff? Right. You do have that. You do have the, and we, we talked about that last time. You do have the officers, uh, you know, uh, gambling for his clothes. You do have people going by, wagging their heads, you know, uh, come down from the cross if you can, blah, 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 right? Um, I do want you to turn to Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> To pick up, so between uh, between nine and twelve a.m., there's actually three other things that occur that are not captured by Matthew that I do want you to see, and, and there's the three other words of Christ here, and so that's why we're going back here to Luke for the first one, in Luke chapter 23, beginning around verse 33. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke 23:33. It says, and when they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
and they divided his garments and cast lots, etc. So this is actually the first statement of Christ on the cross, his father forgive them. Now, who is he saying, who is he saying to forgive? Who is he saying, father forgive them? Who is them? They know not what they do. Those who are persecuting mm -hmm. him. Everybody who has a hand in putting him on the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it, <clears throat> there are there are some who will say, oh, he's, he's focused in just on the soldiers because they didn't know what they were doing, right? They were just following orders. <clears throat> but I think it's a more general statement. It's about everyone who, who does not understand what they're doing. I think it even includes, uh, you know, the religious leaders. It includes, it includes the crowd, right, who has said, uh, you know, we want Barabbas. Uh, so it really is the whole crowd of people that are there uh, who have convicted him, who have put him on that cross. He's saying, Father, forgive them. And it is a it is a, a more general statement about forgiveness, right? It says they don't know what they're doing, but at some point, some of these people do understand what they're doing. Uh, they do repent and they do follow him, right? Because we have uh, very soon after this, we've got 3,000 people that turn to the Lord. Uh, soon after that, 5,000 people turn to the Lord. Right, so so many of these people in the crowd are those are those people. It's interesting to think about, right? These are the people that uh, welcomed him in as Hosanna, you know, when he came in on the triumphal entry, and then they turned around and said, "We want Barabbas." And then uh, then they finally repent and understand who he is, and they become the early church. It's an interesting group of people, right? That uh, that, that are here in this crowd and. So I think that this forgiveness is broad enough to say, hey, Father, forgive them, right? Those that right now don't know what they're doing, but will understand what they're doing and will repent for it, uh, those are to be forgiven. Uh, if you go down, uh, uh, go, uh, go back to Matthew, <clears throat> go back to Matthew uh, chapter 27, skip all the way down to verse 54. <clears throat> At the end of this, you see, it says, so when the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. So here even you see then, right, the centurion and those that were with him. So there's a crowd of people there who understand at this point what uh, what has happened and, and do confess him to be the Son of God. So, you know, this forgiveness is for those people, those people who finally do understand and uh, and accept him as the Son of God, and certainly includes this centurion in the crowd that is there with him. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. So the first thing then, uh, the first thing then that is the um, uh, the reason for the cross, the purpose of the cross, is the cross is about forgiveness, right? It's about forgiveness. Uh, it was the forgiveness that Jesus uh, ex explain ex expands here. Uh, in Luke, and then it's the forgiveness that occurs uh, for these people. And I do want you to go back to Luke again, if you left it. Go back to Luke chapter 23, because I want to pick up the second story uh, that occurs, which is down in verse 39. Luke 23, verse 39. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Now, if you remember a little bit earlier in our study uh, last week, in fact, uh, or last time we studied, <laughs> uh, we looked at the two thieves on the cross. It said that both of them, uh, if you go back to uh, if you go back to Matthew, it actually says that both of them were saying the same thing, were reviling him. If you go back to 2744, the robbers there. But what's interesting now is one of the robbers has had a change of heart. Right, one of them, uh, after now hanging on the cross for three hours, uh, right, has uh, all of a sudden said, "Wait a minute, uh, there's something else going on here." And, and I, I guess the question is, what has happened to this person? How is this possible? 
that this person who who just a few hours ago was reviling him and was condemning him and was uh, you know spitting on him now all of a sudden uh, is 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 condemning the other uh, you know the, the other one on the cross the other criminal hanging on a cross and saying you know how could you say these things to him and then he and then he actually calls him Lord uh, he asks him to remember him when he comes into his kingdom how is that possible. <clears throat> That's a loaded question, I think. <laughs> but I, I would say that God chose him. God did it. God did it. God chose him. And he God was, did it. I, that's the only answer that it could be. This is a sovereign miracle, right? I mean, this yeah. is God coming down and 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 grabbing a hold of this man and and turning him around, turning around his understanding, and 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 uh, this this man gets gets saved here on the cross um, because God decided to reach down and save him. It's just a sovereign miracle. Uh, there's, there's no other way to explain it. Um, it you know, the only, the only thing close to this is, uh, is Paul's Damascus Road experience, right? Where, you know, he's going down there to kill all the Christians and God reaches down, grabs a hold of him and completely changes his life. And this is what's going on with this this man who just a few moments ago or an hour ago uh, was condemning Jesus, and then God got a hold of him, and he turns his life. You know, it does say there's nobody out of the reach of God, right? There's nobody, even the, the worst of sinners. Uh, certainly, the, the the Jewish religious leaders would never have thought of this person as someone uh, who God would be interested in, right? Who God would be would care about who God would love, uh, but but God reached down and grabbed a hold of him, turned his heart around uh, such that he accepted Christ here on the cross. Any other comments on that? You got that? Well, can you argue that's, the, that's every salvation experience? Every, good, thank you. But thank you. Or minutes away from dying. At exactly. Every salvation experience is a sovereign miracle of God. Absolutely. That's 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 the point I wanted to make. Good. So the cross is about forgiveness. The cross is about miraculous conversions, right? It's about sovereign miracles. Uh, the, that's the first two things we we see uh, from the from the words of Christ here. The third one is actually in, in uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, so go to John chapter 19. <clears throat> This is a very personal one by John. John chapter 19, verse 25. <clears throat> verse 25 says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So remember again, um, Mary, you know, his mother, of course, is Mary. His mother's sister is Mary. <laughs> Uh, who is the wife of Clopas, who we also know is the is the mother of John. Uh, so this is Mary and her sister and Mary Magdalene, three Marys. Verse 26, and when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved. Now, who's, who is the disciple whom he loved? John. John. It's John, right? And, and, and again, I, I think John's use of that phrase is simply because he never got over the fact that Jesus could love him. Uh, he just never got over that. And so when he talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's not saying that to say he's somehow special. He's just saying that to say, I can't believe that Jesus loves me uh, because of who I am. Anyway, Jesus said, for saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So here we have Jesus is, Jesus in the, you know, during these first three hours, from 9 a.m. till 12, the weight of mankind's sin is laid on Jesus's shoulders, right? Not only the, the physical suffering that he's going through, but the weight of mankind's sin, all of that, is crushing down on him 
And in the midst of that, he sees his mother. In the midst of that, the heart of God shines through. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me to think about someone in the, in the middle of what Jesus is in the middle of, concerned about his mother. <laughs> um, and, and, and not fully consumed with what's going on uh, with, with the suffering that he is in the middle of. In the midst of his worst suffering, uh, his heart shows through, shines through, shows through. <clears throat> so again, the third thing here I would say, the, the cross is about compassion. <laughs> the cross is about sympathy. The ca- cross is about heartbreak. Heartbreak on God's part. <clears throat> and we see that even as, as Jesus reaches out uh, to make sure his mother is taken care of. All right, now we want to, so those are the first three things that Jesus has to say. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 27 to uh, the story that we picked up. <coughs> now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. What's, what's interesting here is, right, when Jesus was born, right, and in Luke, we've just studied it, right, there was a great light in the sky. Uh, you know, he was called the light of the world. Everything about Jesus was about light. And here when he, when he dies, when he's put on the cross, from, the, from noon until three, there's darkness over the whole land. And by the way, uh, the whole land can be interpreted either as just the local land or it could be the whole earth. Depends on uh, which commentary you read, but it, it doesn't matter. It was something miraculous that occurred. Uh, Luke says the sun was darkened. Uh, such that, uh, you know, the, the, there was darkness over the whole land. Now, you all know that in the Old Testament, um, darkness is a symbol of judgment. Uh, the, the, and, and the same thing is true in Revelation. We talk about the, ju- when the judgment coming in Revelation. It talks about the skies being rolled up, the sun being darkened, the moon being uh, taken away. So this, this I, I really think that this first message that God is giving us here with this first miracle, uh, with the darkness, is uh, saying that this cross is about judgment. It's a place of divine judgment, a judgment for sin. And so this, this miracle of the darkness is really about God saying, hey, this cross, this event, this happening is about judgment. And don't miss that part as we go forward. All right, so if you keep keeping a list, first thing I said, the cross is about forgiveness. The cross is about miraculous sovereign conversions. The cross is about sympathy and compassion. And now the cross is about judgment and judgment of sin. Let's go on to verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> now, note that he, it's important that you see that he yelled it with a loud voice. Some would, some would uh, that word can be interpreted, he screamed it out. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, this is a, uh, this is Jesus quoting from uh, uh, Psalm 22. I actually want you to turn there. Turn to Psalm 22. It's a fascinating psalm. <clears throat> Psalm 22. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the whole thing is worth reading. Uh, but Psalm 22, verse 1 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the night season, I am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach to men, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him recuse. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And then it goes on and on and on. I mean, this is... Jesus is no, this is, 
this psalm is recognized as a messianic psalm, and Jesus is quoting that psalm uh, to make sure they make that connection. Now, what's fascinating about this verse, uh, about this statement, is that Jesus is saying, God, why have you forsaken me? So what has happened here is God has separated himself from God. God the Father is separated from God the Son. How can that be? Well, how can that be? <laughs> what does it mean that, why have you forsaken me? Well, it was at this point that Christ took on the sin of man. And God cannot look at sin yeah. and had to turn his back on his son. I think this is one of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible. This, yeah. is, this really sums up what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. That for all eternity, he's been with God as one. And now he steps away from that. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I, 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 that's exactly right. Um, Jesus has taken on the sin. Let me, I'm just going to repeat what he said. Jesus has taken on the sin of the whole world. God cannot look on it. And so he turns his back on him. How, but what's amazing to me is God turns his back on God. Right? God, you know, it's kind of like um, the only thing I can come even close to it is... Um, when you know someone is angry with you and you get that feeling of separation, right, of, uh, of lack of fellowship, right, lack of connectedness, whether it's your spouse or a friend or whatever, and you know there's anger there, uh, there's, a, there's a disconnect. And I think this is what you got here in a, in a very mild sense, but in a much stronger sense with, with Jesus is when, when Jesus... When God cannot look on that sin and turns his back on it. Uh, this is a summary of what Jesus did for us. This is, the, this is the key to what the cross is all about. I just want to read some, some verses to you. You don't have to go look them up, but you, you know what they say, right? In, in Isaiah 53, it says that he was wounded for our transgressions, right? In, in uh, Romans 4.25, he was delivered for our offenses. 1 Corinthians 15.3, He Christ died for our sins. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. 1 John 4.10, God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, so, so the next thing is that at the cross, Jesus became sin for us. Now, one little asterisk I want to add here is, did Jesus become a sinner? No. No. He did not become a sinner. There's no desire in him for sin. His desire is always, my God, my God. Right? That's where his desire is. He never became a sinner because he never desired sin. He became a sin, but he never became a sinner. That's an important distinction. Uh, Hebrews uh, later talks about that uh, uh, Jesus never sinned, uh, you know, through all eternity. So he never sinned, but he became sin for us. He 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 bore the curse for us. All right, <clears throat> let's keep going then. Verse forty-seven. Any other comments on that? I mean, I I think, um, as Tim said, this is the, this is a critical piece of the message. So I don't want to go too fast for it. The only thing I'd add, Rich, when Tim said that was excellent, by the way, is that Jesus had he knew he had to do it alone. He had to do it by himself. To establish. 
taken on sin for all mankind. He couldn't have any help. Yeah, we're going to get another side of that here in a few minutes too, Russell. So that's good. <clears throat> all right, let's let's go on down. Verse forty-seven. Then is it some? I'm sorry, Michelle. I just want to think too. This is when Christ is fully human. You know that he's separated from God, so he's fully human, but without sin or without sinning. I, I thought that too because he he knows why he didn't forget why. I mean he says why God why have you? I mean he he knows why, but he's acting as Michelle said. You know he's apart from God at that moment. Um, but he didn't forget why it was happening. But he's asking why. And I just thought is that because <coughs> condition of total separation from God? That's how we might act. You know I don't know. It's just. I wouldn't I wouldn't take that too far uh, because of what's going to happen here in a little bit in the rest of the story. Um, but um, it, what's interesting is one of the commentaries said that uh, Luther struggled with this uh, idea of how could God separate from God. So he went away uh, on a, a little study of his own, spent time away just studying this idea of how God can be separated from God. He came back from that study and he was more confused than when he left. So, so, so you know, uh, I wouldn't, uh, don't, don't, again, don't try to put it in a box that's too small for our heads. Uh, this whole idea of how God could be separated from God, uh, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's keep going. Verse 47 then. To so some of those who stood there, when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately, 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 one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Um, you know, when when Jesus up in verse 46, right, says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, um, there are those, you know, uh, people say, well, maybe he was saying Elijah, Elijah. Um, most of the commentaries actually think that this, these statements here in 47 and 49 about Elijah are just ridicule, are just more ridicule. Nobody, everybody understood what he was saying. Nobody misinterpreted him thinking it was Elijah. They're just trying to make something up again. You know, let's, let's uh, see if Elijah comes to save him. Let's see if he can get himself down from the cross. This was just more of the mocking of Jesus uh, uh, when he's on the cross. Now, <clears throat> you do have this interesting passage in the middle of verse 48, right, is that they they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. I do want you to flip back to John a minute, because there's, again, another statement that Jesus makes that's not recorded here. In John chapter 19, <clears throat> I don't know what I said. John chapter 19, verse 28. It says, after this, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there. They filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So here you see kind of the, 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 the next thing that Jesus says is, I thirst. And one of the reasons he said it was to fulfill scripture. So again, the connection there is that the cross is the fulfillment of scripture in all of its, uh, you know, in all of the ways that it occurs. Uh, we certainly see it's the fulfillment of scripture. One other thing that's kind of interesting here to me uh, that kind of hit me in this picture, it says they filled the sponge with sour wine. By the way, sour wine would just be uh, the typical uh, refreshing drink of the day. It's not, you know, very strong wine. It's mostly water. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, they would put it, it says that they put it on a hyssop reed or on a reed and put it to his mouth. I think we have this picture of Jesus on the cross kind of way up in the sky. And I think that that may, ha may be a bad picture. Uh, if they put it on a reed, now this may be four foot long maybe six foot. Uh, so Jesus is kind of right. He's just off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe four foot uh, off the ground. 
and they're looking right dead into his his uh, intestines. They're looking right into his face as he's hanging on the cross. He's not kind of way up there where they can't pay attention to him. He's right there. Um, I, I just, I think we have a bad picture in our head of Jesus kind of up there where you could just pass by and ignore him. No, he's right there in your face with this suffering. And uh, uh, so that, that just kind of hit me this time as I looked at that that reed that went up to his, his up to his mouth. <coughs> that picture, part of, part of why we have that picture is anytime you see the three crosses, the, the, the one in the middle is always much higher than the other two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're all way up in the air. Yeah, and, and then, even, you know, even when we've done living pictures and things like that, right, they're way up in the air. And I think it's a miss picture. I think uh, these these crosses are not that far. They're just enough off the ground uh, so that they can, you know, he can hang from it. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I just think that the people being able to see the anguish in Jesus's face and body uh, is, is part of the horror of this picture that we, we don't want to miss. <clears throat> right, back to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. No, that's not where I am, is it? Verse 40, verse 50. Yeah, verse 50. Verse 50 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He cries out again with a loud voice. So one thing to don't miss here, he, he, he keeps crying out with a loud voice. This is not someone who is um, withering away. Okay? This is someone who still has all his strength. He cries out in a loud voice. Now, what does he cry out? Well, it doesn't tell us here. So you have to go to John chapter 19 to find out what he cries out. <clears throat> Where we just were a few minutes ago. Why didn't you keep your finger there? What's the matter with you people? <laughs> John chapter 19, <clears throat> verse 30. So here it says in John chapter 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now notice right above that, um, up in verse 28 that we read a few minutes ago, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture had been fulfilled, said, I thirst. And, after, and now verse 30 so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He knew that everything had been accomplished. He fulfills the scripture by saying, I thirst. Now everything is done. And he says, it is finished. It is complete. You know, what's, what's incredible to me is this is Jesus slash God on the cross who is, who knows everything and knows that everything has been accomplished. Knows that all the scripture has been fulfilled. Everything needs to be done. All of the sin has been paid for. All of the work is complete. Nothing else is needed. And so that is another message of the cross. And that is the cross is a finished work. The cross completes it. The cross is everything. Nothing else is needed except the work that Christ did on the cross. The cross is a finished work. Flip back to Luke chapter 23 again. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. One more statement that Jesus makes here. <clears throat> it says, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So Jesus says, it is finished. And then, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I do want you to go back to Matthew again. <coughs> Look at what it says in Matthew, what we read a minute ago, in verse 50. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and we just read what he cried out. 
it is finished and into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he yielded up his spirit. He yielded up his spirit. Jesus didn't expire on the cross. This word for yielded up his spirit is an active word. He sent the spirit away. Jesus' life was not taken from him. He voluntarily gave it up. Most victims on the cross last two or three days on the cross dying. Jesus lasted hours and gave up his life when he decided to give it up. Turn to John chapter 10. Passage that we read a little bit of a couple of weeks ago. But now in this context, it's very important. John chapter 10. <clears throat> wow. John chapter 10. We are going way too slow. John chapter 10. Verse 11. <clears throat> John chapter 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, right? Verse 15, as the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus has the power to give his life away, has the power to send the Spirit away. The cross is an act of voluntary sacrifice that could only be done by God, who has the power over death and life itself. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The cross is an act of voluntary sacrifice that can only be done by God because he alone has the power over death and life. All right. <clears throat> You'll have to think about that one because that's an important one and you're way too quiet. Well, let's move on. <clears throat> Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So Jesus at this point is, has died. Uh, Jesus at this point has given up his spirit. He's done speaking, but God is not done miracling. <laughs> he has more to say. And the first thing is the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the veil is uh, 30 feet by 30 feet. Some people say four inches thick. And the thing is split from top to bottom. The, the, the veil was the separation between the people and God. The veil is now split and from top to bottom to show that God has done it. What's interesting to think about is when this occurred, the temple will be jammed with people, right? This is the Passover. People would be in there, jammed around, and then all of a sudden, the, the veil would be split from top to bottom. This had to be an amazing miracle to be seen by, by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that were going through the temple in that time. For the for this uh, this veil to be torn, but it, but it's all about <clears throat> Jesus saying, "Now you have access to God because of what I have done right. through the cross. Through the cross, there's now total access to God because He paid for our sin. And now now Hebrews can say, "Let us come boldly to the throne," right? We can come boldly to the throne. We can come right to the throne. Jesus is here instituting the new covenant. This was supposed to be the end of the temple. 
the end of the sacrificial system. And of course, the temple is torn down in a few years after this, physically. <clears throat> but, but spiritually, the temple is eliminated at this point because the new covenant is put in place through Jesus' death. There's now total access to God. There's no more veil. There's no more hidden. At the same time as the earthquake, the rock split, right? This, you know, what's interesting is earthquakes all through Scripture, Old Testament and New, are a symbol <clears throat> of God either appearing or acting in some way. I really think what's going on here is, is, Jesus, is God is saying, hey, uh, I want to give you a taste of what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. <laughs> and here at the cross, we're going to give you a little, little earthquake, a little rock split, What's interesting is in the historical records, uh, this uh, this earthquake uh, proceeded out uh, quite a ways. Uh, that's uh, recorded in the historical records, not just here in Scripture. Uh, but I think God's giving them a taste, saying, "Hey, this cross is the beginning of what is going to end up in the second coming. Because of what's happened here, there's going to be the second coming." And I think He's giving them a real, uh, just a small taste of it uh, here with the earthquakes. <clears throat> the final miracle is in <clears throat> verse 52. It says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Whoa. <laughs> I wonder if you want to bring that up. We've been, Deb and I were talking about that. Are you going to talk about verse 52 and 53? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Who are these people? Who are these saints who have fallen asleep? Who could they be? Probably <clears throat> martyrs, people who believed in God before, and then they died. I, I don't know. Before what? Before Jesus came. On before Earth. Jesus came, there were people that believed? Yes. Pathetically. Were people, could people in the Old Testament be saved? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, these are Old Testament saints, right? Yeah. These are Old Testament. So, so, so just, just to give you real quickly, Old Testament people are saved in the same way that New Testament people are saved. And that's by believing in Christ, right? Believing in the Messiah. They look forward to the Messiah. And in the New Testament, we look back to the Messiah, right? So these are Old Testament saints who were looking forward to the Messiah when this, uh, when this uh, earthquake occurs, graves are open. Many of them become, uh, get their immortal bodies, right? The spirits are reconnected to their bodies. They get their immortal bodies, and they start hanging around the earth for a while. <laughs> Look what they do, verse 53. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That might have been fun, huh? <laughs> what kind of testimony do you think they might have? What kind of impact do you think they might have? You think 3,000 people might respond? <laughs> right? When Peter talks about it, and they said, well, you know, we saw Moses the other day. He was just hanging around town. <laughs> wow. So is this the first zombie apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the one thing is, a couple things that are interesting here is that uh, in 1 Corinthians, it talks about Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection, right? He had to, he had to be, uh, he had to die on the cross before these folks could be resurrected. Um, but, but they come, they're resurrected, and they go into the city, and, and they're, they're speaking with people. They're appearing to people. They're, they're, they're testifying to people. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. One thing to remember, when Jesus came back, uh, you remember the only people that he met with then was believers. He didn't meet with non-believers. And it's very likely that these people coming out of the grave also did only meet with believers, right? They were encouraging them. They were uh, teaching them. They were helping them. Uh, those, uh, you know, those who are in this uh, slump time between uh, Jesus dying and Jesus being resurrected. It's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, it's a fascinating event, really. 
and a, and a miracle. And, and again, it, what, is, what is the message relative to the cross? The message is the cross is the only hope for resurrection, right? The only way someone's going to be resurrected is because of the cross, because the penalty is paid for, because sin is paid for. Then there could be resurrection. Then there can be a second body. Then there can be, you know, heaven uh, because of the cross. I'm not going to say much more about that, Russell. Was there something else you wanted me to say? No, no. Okay. So let me just review real quick. <clears throat> what did I? What did I say? What did we learn from these miracles, and what did we learn from these sayings of Christ? <clears throat> Number one, the cross is about forgiveness, right? The cross is about forgiveness. Forgive them; they know not what they do. The cross is about miraculous conversions, miraculous sovereign decisions by God, conversions. The cross is about compassion and sympathy and, and the heart of God. At the same time, the cross is about divine judgment. And the big one is, as Tim brought forward, right? The cross, at the cross, Jesus becomes sin for us. And the Father could not look on him because he becomes sin for us to deliver us from our transgressions. The cross fulfills scripture. The cross is a finished work. Work. Nothing else is needed. The cross is a voluntary sacrifice that could only be done by God, who has the power over death and life. Through the cross, there's total access to God. God has given us a taste of the second coming through the cross. And, and then finally, what we just said was the cross is, the, is our only hope for resurrection. It's the basis upon which resurrection and heaven and eternity is based. The cross is important. The cross is the critical key piece to our salvation. And what's amazing here to me is that the commentary on it is given to us by God and Christ themselves through the words and actions that they do right here on the cross. All right, anything else? Good, Mitch, thanks, very good. Powerful to me. I found it really powerful. And, and you know, I, I almost feel bad that we went so quickly through that because each one of those deserved a, a lesson of its own. Honestly, they're, they're powerful, powerful state, statements. So, but, but, you know, I like to go through the scripture quickly. So, <coughs> yeah. One, one thing that came to my mind when you were just talking about the, you were talking about the, People coming out of the graves and so forth. Why wouldn't he? It just makes me wonder why Luke wouldn't put that in his in his writing. Is this the only one that has that mentioned that they, you know, that all these dead people rose and. This is Matthew we're talking about. Right. I'm just saying. Yeah. Just, it, yeah I don't know. It's just it's, it's, it's a good question and and. And, you know, the other thing is, what's amazing to me, you think about the, the temple veil being torn, hundreds of thousands of people saw that, at, right? And then, then, then you got a bunch of dead people walking around town, right? <laughs> and, and you think the whole community's got to be completely freaked out, right? But, mm -hmm. but of course, 3,000 people do turn, right? And then 5,000 in the next week. So the, there is obviously a big response to all this, but but still, you, you would think millions would have turned. But it just shows uh, that, you know, our, our hearts are just so wrapped up in evil and ourselves that we don't even see when when this kind of thing happens right in front of our face. <clears throat> you know, we talked about God was giving us a sample of what it's going to be like. You know, he split some rocks. He had an earthquake. People came out of the graves. I mean, that's, that's the second coming. You talk about mm -hmm. them looking... Ahead, we're looking back. That's history is going to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
you know, I don't know that we'll all go around town for a while. I mean, we're going to get in with him, but that's that. It'd be kind of fun, though. Yeah, it would. <laughs> you know, if you, if you follow the logic, those those saints that came out of the graves, they had to be in their resurrected bodies. Yes, absolutely. And they absolutely. and there they went to heaven. They didn't go back yeah. in the grave. Yeah. No, that's right. So they, now, we don't know if it was all of them or some of them. It's not clear, right? But but there's enough of them to be wandering around town. Yeah, but yeah, they're in the resurrected bodies. They're going straight on to heaven at this point. Absolutely. So another question for you. We've been through Revelation. Are these saints the same saints that they mentioned there? <laughs> I mean, these are a portion of those saints, yes. Okay. I'm not saying that, you know, the saints... There's several different uh, saints talked about in Revelation. Some of them, uh, you know, are the disciples. Some of them are, uh, you know, uh, other believers. Sometimes he's talking about the Jews when he's talking about the saints. So I, I can't make that a blanket statement. But these are certainly some of the Old Testament saints that are going to go. They get a they get a nice uh, free ride up to heaven before the the big events happen later on. So I, I don't, how do you, how do we know that? How do we know that they were in their resurrected bodies? Wasn't all of the saints? I mean, did, and when did they go to heaven? I mean, we not say. We don't know how long they stayed. Yeah. How long did they hang around? Somebody should. I mean, the only way that they could be bodies that were raised were if they're resurrection bodies. All, uh, honestly, all the commentaries agree with that, that these had to be resurrected bodies uh, that, you know, again, their spirits. Where, where are the spirits of the dead? Right. The spirits of the dead are in heaven. The bodies are in the ground. So the spirits from heaven have to be reconnected with resurrected bodies that are created here. <laughs> don't, don't ask me to explain all this. I don't understand it. <laughs> There's spares. You know, are they still be here? Right. Uh. Yeah, they might be still hanging around. You better watch out. <laughs> so the other thing I found interesting <laughs> is my thought was Christ was the last of the three to die. It was the climactic. Christ is the last one on that hill to die. But what we're reading today is he was dead before they broke the legs of the two thieves on either side. Yeah, I would just think, hey, if you're going to do it, he's the last one to go. The other two are gone, and this is the climax. It didn't happen that way. No. No, he was he was he was most probably the first one to die. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. We probably need to move to prayer requests. Um, <clears throat> I probably still need a prayer for my bronchitis, which uh, what's funny is I went to the doctor and the first doctor said, well, yeah, we should we'll give you this medicine. You'll be done with it. You'll be over with it by the weekend. Then the weekend was over. That was last weekend. And I went to the second doctor and he said, uh, oh, yeah, this should take about 18 days. <clears throat> so I don't know. Recording. Thanks. I appreciate your prayers for my bronchitis. Um, just so to, we had uh, a whole bunch of kids uh, here.